Thank you, Professor Porter. Uh, now, can we just get into a quick Q&A with Wilfred Olber? Uh, Wilfred, can you come on, uh, come on stage fairly quickly? <laughs> Everything is fairly quickly today. <laughs> yes, it has to be. You have exactly 10 minutes. No more than 10 minutes. No, no, we'll be just putting the chairs. Please get the chairs. OK, we're trying to put the chairs. Good, perfect. Yes, yes, uh, that's how it is. So uh, we have time for one question from the audience in between. Uh, so yes, Himanshu, if you have a question, please. sugar companies or large dairy cooperatives like Frislin Campina or Arla Dairies, is there a reason? Are we missing something there? Is because they have a supply chain very well integrated with their uh, business model. Yeah. Well, uh, again, there could be, uh, there's a lot more companies that are doing good things than are on that list. And uh, it's going to take, it'll take multiple years to see more of those companies uh, um, uh, you know, uh, be on the list. Uh, I think Danone was on the list. If it isn't on this one, I, I can't remember. Uh, because Danone has gone through a real corporate transformation around shared value thinking and reshuffling their corporate portfolio and, and, and really working hard to engage more and more uh, with its supply chain. Uh, we, we've got some companies that are in a very awkward position. Their supply chain creates shared value, but their product may not. You know, sugar is not what, you know, we need to maximize, you know, health and nutrition. I mean, we, sugar is not bad, but, but in moderation, but so Pepsi is a great example of a company. It's great that they're doing so many good things, but ultimately their products, their snack foods and their sugared beverages are sort of a bit of a conflict with, uh, the fundamental need of society for better nutrition. So uh, I think we're starting to see the consumer food sector and the beverage sector um, and the dairy sector uh, work hard to start migrating their products more towards nutrition and, uh, and supporting uh, uh, you know, healthy growth in, in kids and things like that. But, but that, that is still work in progress. It's taken a lot of complex technology to remove sugar content uh, to, uh, you know, make products that historically have been causing obesity uh, into products that actually are, are supporting of health. So I think we've got some companies are facing complex issues where historically the industry was set up in a certain way and we have to change that. Uh, so I think we, some of the companies that are doing great work on supply chains are not showing up here for that reason. But uh, the real reason is I think someday we're going to need a list of 500. Uh, companies that are changing the world to capture all the great work that's going on. So I don't want you to think that because a company isn't on that year's list doesn't mean something good is, is, is happening. Okay? okay, so let's sit down yeah. and... Thank you, Professor Porter. In fact, uh, Himanshu, you would know that we come out with us uh, doing good uh, list as well in Indian context as well. So we are trying to really uh, pick it up. Uh, but having said that, over to you, Wilfred. And from here on, we'll have Rahul Gangal, who's going to be the, uh, managing the show here for a while. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So thank you very much. Michael is an ex Mercedes man. Let me be as efficient as possible. Sure. And uh, jump into media's race. Uh, we are seeing globally uh, sort of me first culture, whether it's countries against countries, whether it's the polarization within countries. What is the impact on the shared value movement? Uh, does it have an impact and what needs to be done? Well, I agree. I agree that we, we have we, we're in a period where there's, there's sort of been sort of increasing divisions between institutions and, uh, you know, and politics is uh, amplifying divisions. Um, and uh, uh, and, and I, I think that is complicating uh, societies and making progress, you know, in the world. I think we in business, we have to get away from that view. We have to just think about this uh, uh, from our own perspective. We've got to understand how we can make a difference uh, and, and how if we really want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of reduce the conflict between our, our company and, and communities and so forth, we need to take the lead. We need to, we need to take the first step. We need to uh, 
uh, you know, put out our hand first. And I think there are many, many opportunities now, but uh, um, I, I, I am so concerned about politics that I've actually written a major paper uh, with a co-author on that topic, which I'll be uh, publishing in the fall. Uh, I'm very concerned about how politics is standing in the way of, of societal progress. But uh, I think that we in business, despite the complexity and the divisions, we need to just move ahead on addressing some of these opportunities that I talked about. In another paper that you wrote, you talked about sort of the disparity between large companies and small companies. Yep. Large companies having access to government, getting the rules of the game, not sort of doctored, but at least influenced in a way yep. that uh, is actually beneficial. Small companies being much more challenged, yet they generate the jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, many of the small companies or social uh, enterprises are small companies. What needs to be done to really enable a more level playing field for them? Yeah. Well, I think uh, in general, uh, and I'll take India as an example, there's just much too many rules here, much too much complexity. It's just too hard to do anything. And the person that hurts the most is the smaller company. Big company can navigate, big company has a department, big company knows the minister, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Small company, oh my God, what do we do? We have four employees and it's gonna take us six months to work through this permitting process or whatever it is. So I think one of the huge challenges in this country is just to simplify a lot of this stuff and put it online and uh, make it you know, very, very transparent and uh, uh, that, would be, that would be huge. But big companies in a way have had sort of a advantage. The more complicated it was, the more they could succeed. And, uh, I think uh, that, that is an issue in India big time. I think it's also an issue in other parts of the world. Uh, you mentioned the social enterprise. What we're seeing is sort of a whole new generation of social entrepreneurs that are actually using business models to deal with society. And what's that? That's creating shared value. So we actually see uh, some nonprofits acting like businesses. And I think that's an amazingly powerful trend. And over time, you know, uh, we're going to see sort of a blurring between nonprofit and for-profit companies. Uh, and I think that's going to be a great thing. And a lot of the innovation has come from people that started out as nonprofits uh, because they were so passionate about a societal need and they were able to figure out that they could create a business model rather than use the traditional philanthropic model of getting gifts and then doing something uh, for, no, for, no, for no charge. So, uh, uh, you know, very interesting shuffling around of roles of various institutions in society going on right now. We see other NGOs now working with businesses on shared value strategies. Um, and uh, so there's a... Uh, uh, I think there's all kinds of opportunities here, and you know, I'd love to hear your stories as you start thinking about this, and I'd love to see what Indian companies are doing here. Uh, I think we can take this movement can be a tidal wave no, that will I, sweep across the whole society. Uh, yes, uh, but part of the complexity that these smaller companies have to navigate is, for example, access to funds. If we mm -hmm. look at what's happening in the Anglo-Saxon countries, we have large banks in mm -hmm. the UK, for example, that's an issue to really fund local businesses, mm -hmm. even if it's a run-of-the-mill business. Yep. Uh, how can we uh, support these kind of shared value businesses? And again, focus. I understand a large company has a department, has the funds. HUL basically took their uh, Shakti Amma project and uh, made it a professional part of their distribution channel, made mm -hmm. a reasonable margin on this. Mm -hmm. That is feasible. But how do I get to the point where these smaller companies can scale? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and get the funds. Well, I think a gigantic problem with India is access to capital, particularly for small companies. Uh, this is something I'll be chatting with your leaders about tomorrow uh, in some detail. Um, I think, um, uh, in, and in general, you know, financing small business has been a chronic problem uh, in many parts of the world, uh, as you as you mentioned. Uh, I think what we're finding in America now is there's this whole fintech revolution. And what we're finding is that with new technology, we can make relatively small business loans much, much more efficiently. 
and, uh, and we're doing even online models. Uh, and uh, we're seeing billions and billions and billions now going into a lot of small, smaller and medium-sized companies. So I think, I think in India, we've got a more basic problem. The financial sector is, uh, there's too much bad debt, there's need a better bankruptcy laws, we gotta you know, clear all this paper off the books, uh, we gotta regenerate the supply of capital, that's a government issue, but I think on the, at, down at the grassroots level in the financial services industry in this country, uh, I think we need to move on to some new models of, of small business lending, and uh, I think those models are sitting there to be taken. Just, uh, I mean, uh, I share your opinion on the 2% CSR, but wouldn't that be an opportunity, not only in India, in other parts of the world as well, to potentially fund a shared value uh, venture fund? Well, you know, we're seeing shared value venture funds pop up uh, all over the world uh, because people have figured out, if they believe what I've been saying, they, they realize that some of the best, most successful businesses in the future are gonna be businesses that are based on this philosophy so we're seeing, we're seeing a variety of funds. We have some case studies on them that we teach at HBS. We're seeing this huge mo movement called impact investing, where investors are looking for companies that are gonna have impact because, first of all, they're gonna be great companies, but if they have impact, the investors feel even better you know, about the investment. So there's, there's all kinds of innovation going on in funding models for this kind of work. Uh, I think we need to bring those to India. There's no reason why those can't work here even better uh, than we see in the US. Another question, I mean, if you look at, uh, you're a strong proponent of uh, free markets, strong proponent of uh, companies, but now if you look at it and you look at the recent past, we've had misaligned incentive systems, we had the great financial crisis, we had the diesel gate. Uh, can companies do everything? Should they do everything without government? Should there be a synergy? How would that ideally work? Well, I think, you know, I think, uh, uh, first of all, the, the government, government inevitably has to set some rules. And we want to set those rules, and, and some of those are rules and some of those are regulations. We need to set those rules to make sure that we have fair and open and transparent competition, um, that we have a level playing field, that some people don't you know, dis get distortion benefiting them. We want the companies that are most productive to win. Uh, and uh, so we need rules, and we need government. Um, you know, I think that... Um, uh, however, I think we in business uh, ultimately have to, uh, uh, you know, take you know more initiative and and see more opportunity to kind of widen our traditional narrow boundaries uh, uh, and uh, and and take on uh, uh, some of this stuff. And uh, so I think I think uh, uh, you know business needs regulation. We should welcome it. We should welcome having a fair, open playing field. Uh, we should we should be uh, you know uh, we should be cooperating and uh, uh, on putting in place the right kind of regulatory environment. Um, you know, there's always going to be companies that abuse their tr the trust. The VW situation is just like horrendous, and uh, uh, you know. Maybe you could argue there's so much shareholder pressure that everybody's trying to get the special edge and so they're going to bend the rules and so forth. And my view is, is we should mercilessly punish companies that behave that way. Perfect. Uh, just and, uh, uh, but, you know, but ultimately, we can't assume that every business is going is, is gonna, is gonna to violate the rules. Uh, we have to have good rules. We have to enforce those rules. Obviously, Part of the problem is within companies themselves, getting their employees to follow the rules. Uh, every company has to have a compliance programs and all those kind of things. But, but there's always going to be bad actors. We can't let a few bad actors deter the rest of us from uh, moving ahead in the ways we've talked about. So basically regulate but don't overdo it. Just one exactly. last question. Yep. In India, among economists, one of the things that's being discussed is we actually need to focus not on creating a level playing field for companies, we should focus on creating a level field, uh, playing field for individuals. Mm -hmm. right? What is your take on that? Because if you look at it, globalization has uh, in the beginning created discontent in emerging markets. Currently emerging markets are seeing some improvements, but it's the mature markets where a certain amount of dissatisfaction is mm -hmm. there. Uh, how do you look at that? Yeah. 
Well, I think, uh, you know, the idea of a level playing field for, uh, for citizens is uh, a really intriguing, intriguing idea. I think the, the number one problem we have in America with globalization is not globalization. <laughs> Uh, the number one we have in America is the, our failure to improve our education system. And the people that are not doing well in America are all people that don't have a good education. Every one of them. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and it's shame on us. Uh, and we, politics in our country has stalled the improvement of our schools. Every year the PISA rankings come out, which rank across many countries in terms of the quality of schools. And we get lower and lower and lower every single year, where I think we're down to like number 20 or 25 or something. We, in America, in, almost invented universal public education for all of our citizens. We were once on top, now we're down in the 20s. And politics has stopped us from making progress. So I think that um, uh, we, and, and that's part of the Bill of Rights for every American citizen. You deserve a decent education. You deserve to have some reasonable health care and insurance against going bankrupt because you get sick. There's a certain set of fundamental you know, rights that we, that we need to have for citizens which are a prerequisite for participation in the modern economy. And, and the people that are, that are protesting the most are the people that for whatever reason, because of race or religion or whatever, have, uh, or because of where they live, uh, have been denied those, those fundamental assets necessary to actually prosper. And see, the bar has gotten higher now. You know, the skill you need to be in the workforce is higher than it used to be. And, and we, didn't catch, we didn't respond to that with improving our institutions uh, so that we could, we could continue to uh, allow all Americans, which traditionally was the case, to really benefit from the American dream. So that's, that's our fault. Shame on us. And, I have come to believe that the core problem in America that has caused us to fail is politics. And we, so the next challenge we have in America is we have to redo the American democracy. We have to change how it works. It's failing now. And, uh, you know, democracy is complicated everywhere. It's never simple. But I think our democracy has been really hijacked by the political parties and uh, is not leading to the solutions we need. So uh, anyway, stay tuned for that. I, I may never leave America again when they arrest me for this work. Uh, this may be the end of me, but uh, I think we have to take it on. It's, we can it's, give you political asylum here in it's India. It's the next big issue. I may need political asylum. No, I think, I, I mean, my hope is uh, still there. Having lived in the US and seeing how fast you guys normally react to challenges, I would still be uh, optimistic that uh, things will be fixed and you don't have to immigrate. With that, I would really uh, like to thank you for your insights. Thanks, Atam. It was a thank very you. nice Thanks discussion. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Porter.